Derek Percy is an Australian criminal vilified by every person who knows his name. Police have spent the day interrogating the man they believe is responsible for some of Australia's most notorious child murders. We're talking about some of the, the most mysterious crimes in the last century. Percy is a person who has excited a great deal of media interest. Hitting the headlines over 40 years ago for a crime that changed the very fabric of Australian society. His actions and the way he dealt with the young girl were horrific. Maybe it's the first time people started to look at strangers a different way. It was certainly the time when Australia lost its naivety. The graphic murder of 12-year-old Yvonne Tui was only the start, as more heinous crimes unraveled, directing suspicion to Percy. Percy is also a suspect in the disappearance of Adelaide's Beaumont children. There can be nothing worse than the random abduction and murder of children of which Percy is a suspect not in one but in several cases. And would sensationally culminate in detectives questioning him on his deathbed. Did you abduct and murder your sister? The notoriety surrounding one of the country's most evil killers and the mystery that shrouds him to this day makes this a crime that shook Australia. Derek Ernest Percy, from Mount Beauty, Victoria, is a man who has puzzled officials for decades. Derek Ernest Percy is one of the most peculiar criminals we've got in Australia. A criminal who has slipped into the shadows ever since a day that changed history in 1969. The day, of course, was a, a Sunday. It happened that uh, on that particular day, we found out during the afternoon that a little girl had disappeared uh, down near Frankston. The girl reported missing is 12-year-old Yvonne Tui. Yvonne Tui had gone with a friend called Shane Spiller to a beach. The two young children are in the quaint coastal town of Warneet, Western Port Bay, 55 kilometres southeast of Melbourne. Close to the water, they decide to play on one of the many beaches that surround them, just yards away from Yvonne's home. Warneet is an area of bushland and beachfront outside of Frankston, not a terribly popular area. And in the middle of winter, July, an area that people don't visit a lot. They drive past it, but they don't stop there too often. But today, the young friends are not alone on the beach. As they innocently play, everything changes within seconds. Shane was with the little girl Yvonne when Bella approached them, grabbed hold of Yvonne and insisted that uh, Shane uh, come to her rescue and threatened that if, uh, if he didn't come over that uh, Yvonne would be injured. As the children stand terrified, the stranger tries to also snatch Shane, but the little boy reaches for a small axe he has brought with him. He was astute enough to pull a little tomahawk out of his backpack and run off. Shane Spiller flees to get help as his friend is dragged away and into a nearby car. He signalled down a passing motorist. So he was able to provide a good deal of detail, which is pretty smart for a child under those circumstances. The search for the vulnerable little girl is now paramount. Officers are relying on Shane and any other witnesses to stand a chance of getting to Yvonne. 
He was able to describe the guy, he was able to describe the car. When Sam was asked about the car, the most significant thing that he was able to tell us was that there was a, uh, a Navy sticker on the back of the car. He was able to tell us what colour it was. He was able to tell us it was a little station wagon. And uh, with the aid of other, the other passers-by, they were able to give us a colour. And a, uh, it was described, I think, as a, a hillman. Somebody else was able to provide that it had New South Wales plates on. And being in the state of Victoria, of course, that made it uh, much more meaningful. Other witnesses were in the same area. So the car had attracted some attention. And one particular witness provides information that indicates the abductor is planning to take Yvonne to somewhere secluded. He came forward and he described having seen a car being driven erratically along a dirt road in that area. Officers widen their search for the sighted vehicle. As each minute goes by, they fear for Yvonne's life. I guess it doesn't become much more pressurised than in being told that a 12-year-old a girl has been abducted from the beach. Nobody knows where she's gone. She was last seen by a little boy who saw a man holding a, uh, a knife to her throat. So in terms of pressure, in terms of doing what you do as a policeman, it doesn't get more meaningful than that. As an extensive search begins, Yvonne's friend Shane and other members of the public provide crucial information. And one clue in particular proves to be invaluable. There are a lot of people who did a lot of right things on that day, not the least of, of them being the little boy. The passers-by did the right thing. The first police to attend did the right thing. The first police to attend went to Cerberus because of the sticker on the back of the car. Cerberus is a naval base 35 kilometres south of Warneet. The little boy was able to tell police that he saw a little Navy insignia on the back, so the police went to the nearby Navy base. The sticker that Shane has described on the abductor's vehicle could be an essential clue in finding the perpetrator who has taken his close friend. Officers rush to the location 30 minutes away. Ivan has not been seen for hours. As they arrive at the base, they discover something that will alter the whole investigation. When the police first arrived at Cerberus, they quite quickly, with the aid of uh, naval police, found the car that had been described. But the officers need to be certain it's the same car they are looking for. People, including Little Shane, were able to go to the Naval Depot and pick out the car from the many, many cars parked in the, in the car park at the Naval Depot. It was not at all difficult for the Naval people to identify the owner of the car. They had the, the records well compiled. The owner of the Orange Estate car is Derek Ernest Percy. As officials try to locate him on the base, his vehicle is searched for any possible clues. He was a 20-year-old uh, naval trainee. He was an electrical fitter, I think. The naval base at Cerberus is a, a major naval uh, attachment. It's where young naval officers go to be trained to take on their role in the, in the Navy. And Percy was a cadet naval officer. It is now vital for officers to get to this cadet immediately to find any information on Yvonne's whereabouts. They did look to get uh, Percy to the office by uh, piping him, I think was the expression, and he didn't respond. So they went to his barracks and his barracks mate uh, told the police that he was down doing his washing. When the police get to the laundry facility, they make a very alarming discovery. That's where he was when he was apprehended. He was washing his clothes. They went in. Uh, a senior officer tried to stop them, but they burst in and they found Percy cleaning his blood-soaked clothes.
1969, and 12 year old schoolgirl Yvonne Tui has been snatched by a vicious predator from a beach in Warneet, Victoria. After her friend memorizes the kidnapper's vehicle, officers have raided a nearby naval base and caught the owner in a very compromising situation. He was washing his clothes. They probably had blood on them, but he had clothes in the washing machine. So we don't have a picture of somebody standing over a, a tub scrubbing blood out. It wasn't that graphic, but he was certainly washing his clothes, of course. Police took possession of his clothes, asked him preliminary questions, obviously, as to whether or not he knew anything. And he firmly denied that he did do anything or he knew anything or whatever. But he was taken into custody by the uh, naval police people and he was isolated until such time as, as we got there. By now, Yvonne Tui has been missing for over five hours. The possible blood on the clothes is a very distressing sign and Percy needs to provide answers fast. You make sure you got your facts right as best you can. Make sure you got whatever exhibits are available to you at that time as best you can. So we'll, with all that in place, that's when we first started to speak to, to Percy. And worryingly, along with the blood-stained clothes, more incriminating exhibits have been found while searching his car and private possessions. We had his clothes, of course, but the most uh, meaningful exhibit was a bloodstained knife that had been found in his car. There were other knives found in his car. There were also uh, uh, sketches of nude children which we'd found on top of his locker. So there were those sorts of things that early pointed to him. Detectives are now in a unique position. With extremely damning evidence, they must get Percy to reveal what these items are connected to. With nothing pointing directly to missing Yvonne, what would the young naval cadet reveal? He had all sorts of reasons to believe that she was dead at worst uh, or fatally injured. And the only person in the world at that time who could take us there was Percy. And here we were talking to him and trying to get him to tell us, trying to elicit this information from him, and it was very difficult. As we started to speak to him, he was in denial. But in terms of his uh, demeanour, he was very quiet. He spoke in monosyllables. He wouldn't look us in the eye. He was almost tuned out, if you like. He was insisting that he might have done something bad, but he couldn't remember. I can remember Dick Knight and Percy being very quietly and very slowly. It was like watching two people trying to hypnotise each other, almost. Dick Knight was a very skillful interrogator. He had the ability to tune in to a suspect and to meet him at the right level. He picked Percy. He knew what would work with Percy, and it did work. After hours of trying to coax information from the suspect, Percy utters these terrifying words. He kept saying, I might have done it, and I can't remember, I might have done it. And eventually he, he said, yes, I, I did kill her, and I can take you to her, she'd be dead. Despite the breakthrough, Bernie Delaney was stunned by Percy's next remark. He agreed to take us there, and uh, as a mark of the man, when we said, will you take us and show us, he said, yes, uh, do I need a coat? Will I be cold? On a winter's night, Victoria police quickly scrambled to get to Yvonne, who has been missing for over 10 hours. And her family is anxiously waiting for any news. We had little idea of what he'd done at that stage. So we went to the scene with uh, forensic people, photographers, with a, an officer from the Navy, with our own inspector. When we got there, uh, Knights insisted that only 
a couple of us go to where the body was because we didn't want to uh, disturb the, the scene. So uh, Percy uh, simply took us to where the body was in the headlights of the car and uh, he showed us the, the body of the poor little girl stretched out on the, on the wet ground. She was bound with her hands behind her back. She had a gag placed in her mouth which was tied in with a rope. She'd had her throat cut from one side to the other and she'd been disemboweled. He was pretty matter of fact about it all. I was uh, close to him for during that time and for the, the days that followed and his demeanour never changed. The details of this unbelievably sadistic crime are hard to absorb. Two innocent children playing on a beach has now resulted in a young girl's life being taken. And the evil perpetrator appears to be remorseless. Following extensive interviewing of Percy in the coming days, officers will discover they are dealing with a criminal whose depraved mind goes beyond comprehension. Police went back to Cerberus and they found in his possessions uh, certain handwritten documents. We then, of course, had to put to him that perhaps he had done some of these things to Yvonne Tui and he admitted, yes, he had. Not only does this young man have the capability to murder in cold blood, but to also act out his extremely dark fantasies. Could there have been any warning signs from his past into this terrifying behaviour? He was quite a normal young kid, probably a nerd, you'd call him in today's language. He collected stamps and he was top of the school until around about puberty where he started to behave strangely. Percy was very, very close to his mother. There is some suggestion that his family started to become aware of Percy's bizarre behaviour at a young age. But it involved things like um, uh, Percy dressing up in, um, in women's clothing, um, violently stabbing um, uh, women's clothing, this type of thing. At Mount Beauty in rural Victoria where the family was living as he was a teenager, uh, he was known as the local snowdropper, somebody that would, you know, jump fences and take underwear from lines and things like that. So it's all quite, it was all quite bizarre, and especially in 1960s Australia. Mrs Percy would let the younger brother of Derek do what he liked, but with Derek, she would always say, where are you going, and ask the friends to look after him. She went to the local doctor, and the doctor said, ah, um, oh, he's just going through a peculiar stage, he'll grow out of it. Well, he didn't. So. He killed poor Yvonne Tui. Derek Percy admits to murdering and torturing the innocent girl. Yet the legal process that follows is one that most people would not have anticipated. He was put before a jury of 12 peers and the trial began, he was charged with murder. He'd pleaded not guilty on the grounds of insanity. The only defence that could be run for Derek Percy was defence of insanity. That is, that the, at the time of the killing, he was insane within the legal concept of insanity. And by the time I came into it, it was pretty clear that there had been a number of psychiatric opinions which confirmed the fact that he was insane at that time in their opinion. And so I took the trial on the basis that's how it would be run. Percy is assessed by a number of psychiatrists to determine his mental state. There was a tremendous amount of material available to them because of his past history and his behaviour and the diaries that he kept. All of that was horrific stuff, but it was very important for the psychiatrist to examine all that. So there was a lot of psychiatric material. All the diaries and all his descriptions were all exhibited and read to the jury, and it was pretty horrific. In fact, my memory is that I think one of the jurors fainted 
during the opening address by the prosecutor. It was a shocking case. At least, from memory, two or even three psychiatrists expressed the view independently of each other that he was insane within the meaning of the law. The disturbing content of Percy's private possessions discovered after Yvonne's murder reveal an extremely alarming insight into his macabre mind that officials now know have stretched beyond his imagination. I can remember saying to somebody one day that a person who would write something like that has a problem, but when he lets you know that he's capable of carrying out, society has a problem. The content of the fantasies Percy has written down are too graphic to detail. But one obsession shows the extent of his depraved mind. He had a fascination with his own faeces, and what made him uh, even more unique was the fact that he involved his victim in that fascination. And a number of psychiatrists have said that they're, in world terms, that's very unusual for a person who's a coprophiliac to, to involve their victims in that predilection. Uh, just so it just shows how unique he is in, in world terms. This is just one aspect of Percy's psyche that leads experts to believe he is not of sound mind. In this case, there was no rebuttal evidence. There was no psychiatrist was prepared to say that he was not insane, in other words. Percy may have fully admitted to murdering Yvonne, but the outcome of this unprecedented trial marks a unique point in Australian criminal history. The jury deliberated for quite considerable time, but finally came out with a verdict of not guilty on the ground of insanity. Derek Ernest Percy, a 20-year-old naval cadet, has just been found not guilty of brutally murdering 12-year-old Yvonne Tui. Despite confessing to the killing and taking detectives to the crime scene, he has pleaded insanity, and the jury have agreed. Now he is to be remanded under a different legal system. In those days, the result was that he was to be detained at the governor's pleasure. That is not a life sentence. It can be reviewed. And there have been a number of cases where people who've committed horrible crimes because of mental incapacity, or psychotic episodes have effectively been cured. No minimum tariff is set on Percy's detention. He is sent to Her Majesty's prison, Pentridge. Yet more than 20 years later, his name comes to haunt the people of Australia once more. So Percy's in jail and that's where it would end except for a young policeman by the name of Wayne Newman, who was given the job of just fixing up an old inquest brief for a little girl called Linda Stillwell, who had gone missing from the St Kilda Beach in the late 60s. And Wayne started looking at the case. Slowly and methodically, he was able to work back and realise Percy was a suspect in the Linda Stillwell case and several other cases around Australia. A number of brutal child murders and abductions remain unsolved from the 1960s. Could Derek Percy also be responsible for these? In January 1965, during the school holidays, two next-door neighbours, schoolgirls, Christine Shorrock and Marianne Schmidt, took Marianne's four younger siblings to the beach. They lived in Western Sydney, and the only way they could get to the beach was by train. They hopped off at the train at Cronulla and they walked up to Wanda Beach, a very popular beach. So the children played in the shallows. But shortly after midday, the girls decided that they would go for a walk into the sand dunes. The younger children were complaining that they uh, were tired, so the older girls made the decision to leave the younger children resting behind a sand dune. They never came back. 
A couple of hours later, the younger children decided that they would catch the train home and report uh, the disappearance of the children uh, to their parents. The tragedy unfolded the next day when the girls' bodies were found buried in a sand dune by a, a young man, a passerby, and uh, the two girls had been badly assaulted, sexually assaulted. New South Wales police question over 10,000 people in one of their largest investigations. Yet still, to this day, nobody has been found guilty of the girls' murders. It looked to be completely a random attack. But why did the girls go into the sand dunes? They had been to that beach the week before. So police thought that they may have met somebody and uh, agreed to meet up later that afternoon. They were seen with a 16-year-old boy. Now, whether or not this boy was involved, he's never come forward, he's never been identified as a suspect, but he does remain the uh, person most likely to have been involved in that crime. Officers compiled an identikit image from witnesses at the time and compared it to a photograph of Percy, who was 16 years old, and also had a connection with the area. Would Percy be a suspect in that matter? Certainly. In fact, you'll find that he had a relative who lived very close to the station where the Wanda Beach girls hopped on to go to the beach. It uh, did come out that his grandmother lived in the adjoining suburb to the girls in Deniston in Western Sydney, which was an incredible coincidence. But whether or not Percy was there that summer, uh, my investigation uh, in speaking to family members uh, doesn't confirm that. However, decades later, in 2007, Victoria Police unearth a stash of Percy's belongings, hidden in a storage unit in Melbourne. It's a, a set of material around videos, around um, other documents, um, handwritten notes, a whole set of material that, that we've um, become aware of has in fact been in that location for 20 years. Within this substantial amount of material, including graphic drawings and notes, Officers discover a map Percy has written on, showing an area near to where the attack happened. But he has never offered an explanation for this. Yet other inconsistencies cast doubt on his involvement. Interestingly, a key piece of evidence in the case could have potentially snared the culprit many years ago. The tragedy of this crime is that there was a DNA sample there was a, um, a sperm sample located on uh, one of the girls' clothing. Over the course of time, and this is years before the advent of DNA technology, the sperm sample was mishandled and did go missing. Christine and Marianne were murdered in broad daylight more than 40 years ago, both just 15 years old. Their horrific deaths remain a mystery to this day. Just one year on from the killings, Australia would be rocked by the disappearance of three siblings, the Beaumont children. The disappearance of the Beaumont children in 1966 from a South Australian beach changed Australia, changed the way Australians parented. From now on, it was the end of innocence. Parents now kept a very close eye on their children. Jane, Anna and Grant Beaumont took a short bus ride to the beach one summer's day, but never returned home. Several witnesses claim to have seen the siblings at the beach with a man. The fact that there was thousands of people at a public beach, it was over 100 degrees in the old Fahrenheit scale. The children were seen playing with a man between 35 and 45 years old, six feet tall, slim build but athletic and tanned. Um, the children played with him as if they knew him. He'd gained their confidence very, very quickly. Yet despite this detailed information, the children vanished without a trace, and no one has ever been held accountable for their disappearance. Various people have become suspects over the years. Could Derek Percy have been the kidnapper? When Derek Percy was interviewed over the murder of Yvonne Tui, he spoke to a school friend who was uh, a constable at the time. 
Derek Percy's best childhood friend, Ronald Anderson, joined the police force just months before Percy was arrested for murder in 1969. Ron Anderson asked him about a number of other unsolved crimes. When asked about the Beaumont children, Percy was evasive and he said, I was there at the time. Now, whether or not he was, or whether or not he was just saying that to throw Anderson off the track, um, is not known. During the course of that summer, the children had been to the beach a number of times with their father. Their father had gone to work the day before and he had dropped them off to the beach. So it wasn't unusual, even though the children were only nine, seven and four, for them to be at the beach by themselves and to catch uh, the bus home by themselves. So this person who did take them from the public beach had gained their confidence either within an hour or two or maybe over the course of a number of visits to that beach over that summer. Yet the man described by witnesses was middle-aged. Derek Percy at the time was 17 years old. Despite various leads over the years, the fate of the three siblings remains a mystery all these years on. South Australia police still keep the case open. Just nine months after the Beaumont children disappeared, Alan Redston was brutally murdered in Canberra. Alan had been tied with a rope and strangled and his body dumped into a local creek. Now, when police tried to rule Percy out of that crime, it was found out that he was living 400 kilometres away at Mount Beauty. They thought that he may have been in Canberra visiting an aunt, so they couldn't rule him out. Also, one of the bindings that the boy uh, had on his body was a school tie. And because Percy was a schoolboy, that was a red flag as well. But as investigations continued, the chances of Percy being the perpetrator looked less likely. It appears that there had been a number of bullying incidents over a number of weeks where children had been tied up. The Australian Federal Police are very confident that they interviewed the person responsible for Alan's death in the early days of that investigation and that these bullying incidents were linked. His body wasn't affected post-mortem like Percy's other victim. Australian Federal Police continue with that stance to this day. The violent murder and mutilation of Simon Brooke two years later, however, does bear some hallmarks of a crime Percy could have committed. Simon Brooke was a shocking case. A three-year-old boy playing in the front yard of his family home on a winter Saturday disappears. His body is found the next day in an adjoining block of land and he had been strangled and post-mortem he had been mutilated with a razor blade. Wayne Newman was able to work out that Percy had been in the Navy, been a sailor, and was stationed up in Sydney. And his uh, trip to the Naval Depot from his lodgings took him virtually straight past Simon Brooks' house. He said that he was driving with his brother on the day of Simon's abduction and killing on that same laneway, near that same railway cutting. Australia's most notorious child killer, Derek Percy, may have been incarcerated since 1970 after the death of Yvonne Tui, but officials fear he may be responsible for many other unsolved abductions and murders across the country. And the horrific killing of Simon Brooke in Sydney points to Percy in more ways than one. I found out that there was a boy's home a number of streets away from where Simon Brook went missing. It's quite possible that the person responsible was scouting for victims among the boys' home when he came across little Simon Brook playing in his front yard. The reason why Derek Percy has been associated with this crime 
is because he was stationed in Sydney at that time. Wayne Newman and his colleagues at Victoria Police spent years reviewing the tragic case of Simon and built up a compelling link to Percy. A very detailed inquest brief went before the coroner. Um, the coroner recommended uh, that brief to the director of the New South Wales prosecutions, uh, the DPP, and the decision was made not to pursue that. There was not enough evidence to lay criminal charges in relation to that matter. So that was certainly a case that we thought um, that Mr Percy was strongly linked to. Percy was a fellow considered unfit to plead. Doesn't matter what you find out about him, he won't be charged. Simon Brooks' family have had to endure the rest of their lives with uncertainty. In a recent statement, his father, Donald, gave his views. Just three months after the murder of Simon Brook, seven-year-old Linda Stilwell is abducted just yards from her house in St Kilda. What connects Derek Percy to this crime? We're talking about a very naive place in the 1960s. Kids were allowed to go out and play and come back at dark. And the, the little independent girl went across to the beach to play, as lots of kids did, but she didn't come back. After playing with her siblings, Linda chose to stay near the beach while her brother and sister went home. When they went back to find her, she had disappeared. Linda Stillwell is a lot like the Beaumont children. We have no crime scene, we have no forensics, uh, we have one or two witnesses, uh, we have no suspect. Linda went missing the year before Yvonne was killed. One of the thrusts was that uh, Linda had potentially drowned. So investigators actually looked at tides and currents, uh, engaged uh, the appropriate um, experts in relation to that, and a line search was conducted all the way down to, um, to Brighton. Uh, they had uh, the army involved. They were probing the soil uh, and the sand just to see whether or not um, a little girl had been washed up. Detectives went door to door just really to see whether or not had she run away, whether she'd got herself into sort of like uh, any confined space that she couldn't get out and, and, and passed away there. They went to the extraordinary length of boarding um, all ships docked at uh, St Kilda and down in the bay at the time to see whether or not um, Linda had been taken on board any of those ships. Despite all of this, police officers at the time drew a blank. Derek Percy was not even known to Victoria Police or any other law enforcement organisation at that stage. Um, so he, uh, he certainly wouldn't have been a person uh, of interest at any stage back at, at, at when Alinda originally disappeared. Yet years later, when Wayne and his colleagues opened the files once more, they spotted alarming factors that could make Percy a suspect. The thing that uh, worried investigating detectives in regards to Percy was that he was on leave at the time, he was in the area, he was active, he committed the crime against Yvonne Tui only eight months later, and so he had a high propensity to be involved in that case. A couple of witnesses said that they saw a, a man with a dark complexion, that may have been Percy, we're not sure, uh, certainly matches Percy's uh, height, he had that gaunt face. When initially questioned about Linda, after he had killed Yvonne Tui, Percy alludes to being in the area at the time. Ron Anderson alleged Percy made comments such as uh, he drove through St Kilda on the day that uh, Linda disappeared. Um, and Ron pursued that and said, well, you know, did you kill her? And he said, possibly, but I can't remember. And I've subsequently interviewed him and he certainly has not made that admission to me. However, Amongst Derek Percy's belongings, discovered in the lockup by police, were maps of Melbourne. Is that the address that you used to own? Yes. The one on? Certain areas, in particular St Kilda, where Linda was last seen, appear to have been drawn on. But when questioned, Percy hasn't shed any light as to why. Do you recall making the markings on the map? No. Mm.
the case will only ever shut if um, the person responsible uh, is charged and brought before the courts or if we find some uh, remains of Linda. The little girl's family have battled for Percy to be forced to give evidence for many years. At one point resulting in an astonishing story that hit the headlines. Percy was pursuing costs against Jean Priest for the court action and in the end fact is stranger than fiction sometimes and we wonder if we have a justice system but the courts found that yes indeed Jean Priest, this grieving mother, did owe Derek Percy, uh, an imprisoned man, a, a killer, uh, somewhere in the order of $80,000 in legal costs and uh, fortunately the Attorney General in the state of Victoria, Robert Clark, stepped in. The unbelievable action never stopped the family's fight. Yet this attempt to claim money isn't the only thing about Percy's incarceration that will enrage the public. Because he was, he was jailed for the Yvonne Tui killing, uh, but he was not convicted, then under the uh, Commonwealth legislation, he's able to continue to receive a naval pension he's been able to uh, be paid somewhere in the order of $300,000 plus in a taxpayer funded superannuation. He's been using this money to invest in uh, shares, um, uh, coins, uh, stamp collections, this type of thing. Throughout the years, Percy has attempted a number of appeals to be granted a minimum tariff, all of which have failed. Linda Stilwell's family continued to work with Victoria Police to push for an inquest in 2009. A relentless determination to make him provide information they feel he has known all along. In recent times, Percy had attempted to be moved from the criminal justice system, from uh, Port Phillip Prison, to uh, the Thomas Embling Psychiatric Hospital. And that, I'm sure, Percy sees as his exit from a jail. Because he can argue that he has been convicted on the grounds of insanity, he should be held in a psychiatric institution, not a mainstream jail. Ever since his original conviction, much debate has surrounded whether Derek Percy suffers from a psychiatric illness or not. I don't believe he is insane. I do believe that he is. Um, he, he has almost full recollection I'm sure that there are killers that um, suppress facts and memories in order to survive themselves mentally. For killers like Derek Percy, there may be an ability to suppress memories in order to live with themselves. And remarkably, when recently assessed once more, the findings were chilling. The courts here have found that on modern psychiatric e evidence that he doesn't have an identifiable psychiatric illness. In a unique step, Percy was issued with a certificate in relation to the inquest into Linda Stilwell's death. Should he reveal anything, it would not be used against him. He chose to remain silent. And so the enigma surrounding this brutal child killer continues. I don't think he's necessarily concealing these matters. Maybe he just refuses to allow himself. But there are telltale things in his diaries which indicates that there's still a flicker there. He was a coward who preyed on children. He can't be forgotten because we need to learn from um, people like this so that our society is safer. Um, it's much better to be proactive and preventative. We can only hope that there was only ever one Derek Percy and there are no others like him. He's a killer, we know. How many times? We still don't. Do you want to make any further comments, Mr Percy? No. No.